Good morrow to you, and well met. The land of Natlan has been made accessible, or at least its first port, and with it comes its fair share of mysteries. Between the pilgrimage, the Night Kingdom, the meaning of the Wayob, the constant assaults of the Abyss, all the topics that are brought up by the main story quest, which I will not be discussing today. If you are curious about those, I'd hope my other video that covers the topic in its entirety could be of interest to you. Instead, today, we will talk about the hidden, more obscure details of Nathlan. What made the land? What was there before? What the hell is a Saurian exactly, and when did they appear? Ancient tribes? Other than that, even. An advanced civilization of dragons and many more things that the current story covers. There are extra mysterious mentions and stories that aren't made relevant yet, such as the story of Koro, the child of the stars who fell down to Natlan, and her friend Ukuku who lied to her in order to keep her on Teyvat, out of love for her, as well as other mentions without further context. Like the Barbarians who worship dragons, who were seen as enemies by the whole of humanity at the time, within three key regions that have yet to be made accessible, which mention a lord of the crossroads, the Python King, a cinder city, an essence of sacrifice, a black tide which is the abyss, or maybe even the forbidden knowledge seeping through the ground during the cataclysm, forcing humanity's advance back to a primitive age. The most fascinating one being by far the ancient empire and city of Ochkanathlan, an ancient city that became entirely corrupted by the abyss, where the Python King seated, which we can probably already see in the horizon in Atlan. Like a gift that keeps on giving, this ancient city is said to be host to a foul dragon at its heart, with the abyss's influence still lingering from 500 years ago hinting at something similar to Elinas. Seemingly, the Python King had a sky-faring treasure ship, which held a special relic that could drive away the abyss. Your guess is as good as mine about why they didn't use such a relic? All these topics are, so far, still a bit obscure, but I am convinced that I will have the chance to elaborate on them in time. We shall begin as far back as possible. In the Age of Dragons, when humanity was little more than a bunch of prepubescent kids, discovering their first Nokia 3310. Back then, dragons themselves had their own tribes, and each tribe had a matriarch. In this first age, there were no hot springs, no lakes, and only dragons. Said dragons looked down on all other beings of this world, be it envoys of Celestia, that we nowadays know as Seelys, or regular humans. The sense of pride and accomplishment of these dragons was heightened by the war the Seven Sovereigns had lost to Fanes, who established Celestia, the Heavenly Principles, forging the dragons' tenacity and defiance after having their world stolen from them. One of these dragons' stories takes place here. Its name was Maui, from the book Maui and the Monitu, long before humans were even united by tribes. Maui was a young dragon who did not share the pride and dignity of its skin. It was instead fascinated by the tales and songs of the Manitu, the omnipresent life force within all living beings, including plants and trees. There are both good and evil Manitus in folklore. Although in Teyvat, they seem to be nothing more than cute blobs of paint. Maui was banished by its fellow, seeing its carefree attitude and interest in humans as indolence. Labelled a juvenile whelp who lacked the ambition and the fury that defines the proud dragons. Maui was roaming the lands, followed by one of the Manitou it was so fascinated by, as its closest and only companion. In their pilgrimage, they witnessed the transformation of dragonkind. Coming across mountains and caverns, it came to see fellow dragonborn, 
who grew silent and fond of the cavern's death, now living in the mountains. Those dragons became the Tipithy's Ori. Entering a forest, Maui called to its skin, being met once again by silence and the sound of rusting leaves. The dragons here having also grown silent and accustomed to the canopy, having become reduced to the Yum Kazoras. Once again, in a land of fog, Maui came across its kin, who warmly invited, if not implored it, to stay and dream with them. Perhaps those were the Ictomizors. Maui finally came to find an elder dragon that could give it the answered sword, as this dragon was the same as Maui, not sharing the sense of fury and dignity of its kin. The dragon, understanding Maui's quest of fury, could not give it what it wanted and closed its door to the young dragon and the money too. Unfortunately, after enduring much of this pilgrimage with Maui and come so far from its land, the Manitu lost its vigor and its life. Maui honored its companion's last wish and scattered the Manitu's body into a pool of sulfur, giving birth to a beautiful clear spring of water, creating the first hot spring of Natlan. Maui claimed this hot spring as its home, causing its body over time to change shape, becoming the very first Koholazor, giving rise to the Metzli, the future tribe known as the People of the Springs, who inherited the song of Maui and its Manitou friend to be remembered for a long time. The story of the land continues in ancient texts, giving us, in parallel, the history of humanity's early development and the forefather of all tribes, the Sage of the Stolen Flame. The Sage, notorious for having brought Phlogiston stolen from the one known as the Great Dragon, was himself believed to be a dragon due to his achievements that nobody else could replicate. His story begins further back, even before the story of Maui, as the first Pyro Archon hadn't been born yet. And so, nobody had visions. Humans were fully subjected to the elements with no control over them. Those humans are not as old as the first people, which Enkanomia was a part of, as they meet the more primitive traits that symbolizes their punishments after Celestia struck them down. As humans wished to free themselves from fate, which was seen as insolence by the heavenly principles. This is confirmed by the blazing sacrificial heart's hesitance, the ascension material, a dagger used by past tribes to carve their own hearts out in offering and sacrifices. If you are unfamiliar with the story of the first people that I mentioned earlier, the civilization that spanned across Tevat in the beginning of times, I encourage you to take a look at my Secrets of Fontaine video, which covers this part greatly. The sage was sent with a fool, Shaq, by the Lord of the Night, to obtain a rainbow shining stone from a great winged dragon. Shaq wished to throw himself at the dragon and fight him directly for the stone, which the sage dissuaded him of, making the fool realize how powerless he was before a dragon. Through the sage's plan, the dragon was blinded by the sage and the duo was able to enter the dragon's lair praising his radiance and pretending to be doctors who could cure him. Continuing their trickery, they replaced the dragon's teeth with grain fruit, making it inoffensive, allowing them to part with the precious stone in hand. The sage, aware of the dragon's powers but that their intellect wasn't particularly superior, realized that the source of their power came from the stone. By breaking it open, the sage was blessed with the power of dragons we know as Phlogiston. He wished to pass along Phlogiston to humanity, but in these ancient times, their comfort was their ignorance, as they did not see a purpose to this glorified fire, as they could meet all their needs for fire and fuel with flint and wood. Through another plan, Chag and the sage managed to gather curiosity for the Phlogiston, allowing humans to come to wield its powers, propelling humans to an age of civilization, building a city 
temples and effigies far above ground. Following their new mastery, the sage decided to raise the newly built city ever higher, ordering its people to not consume anything that comes from the land anymore, except for water, as all waters come from the source of all waters, known as Fontaine. A bit self-explanatory, I know. Wishing to attain through this ascension what he referred to as the Lunar Continent and the Newark Holy Stone, the Lord of the Night himself understood what the sage wanted. Push humanity out of the bounds of Natlan and leaving Tevat altogether. The Lord of the Night decided, under the guise of a regular human, to spread the benefits of the land-grown products such as alcohol, causing everyone to become drunk, and, due to their state, having the sage kick them out of the city and returning to the fairgrounds of Nathlan, bringing Flogiston down with them. The sage departed on his own, and the age of humans of Nathlan started. Chak was now known as a brave and wise hero who took away the Flogiston away from the sage, and, in a dire battle against a powerful wicked dragon, gave birth to the first man-made tribe. Humans being subject to the passage of time, Shaq was left to stand alone, his companions having all passed of age or in battle. Wishing to reunite with his companions on the last moments of his life, Shaq climbed the highest mountain and called out to his companions of old, lighting the first flame. In his call, the god of the night realm answered, and humans throughout Nathlan have heard voices and whispers of familiar voices from a different plane, recognizing their old friends and companions. This signed the birth of the first Wayob of the Night Kingdom. To this day, the influence of the Sage of the Stolen Flame is still felt throughout the land, being the character referring to you as the Traveler, as the Chosen of Dragons, telling us about his past dealings with Shbalanke, as well as his potential nature as a dragon. He seems to have largely affected or been affiliated with the old empire and lost city of Ochkanatlan, which isn't too well covered for now, but it is most likely the remains we are already able to see in the distance as of patch 5.0. The more modern history of Natlan is found with the history of the Children of Echoes and the Elder of its era, Traure, dating back 500 years during the Cataclysm. A tale passed along the tribe refers to a cruel volcano lord who claimed the spot after the dragons fled, in the appearance of a black and purple giant salamander. It was said to be a wicked being who committed all possible vile acts. The truth of this volcano lord being nothing more than a metaphor to refer to the abyss itself, making the tale more bearable for children. The elder was ready to sacrifice himself to pin down the volcano lord or the abyss. He references the use of a black flood guided by two of his foreign friends. It was either the abyss itself or, once again, the forbidden knowledge. These friends, coming from Kenria, are known in the Natlan folklore to be figures of evil as per their personal wish, but they were in fact heroes. These two characters are entirely omitted from the books and history, despite their own sacrifice allowing the sealing of the abyss and the survival of Elder Traure. He, in turn, acknowledges the weakness of the Shadow Pins, as they are not an eternal seal by themselves, and must be often, let's say, replanted, but that strength lies in the immortal and indomitable spirit of the people of Natlan, compensating the pins weakening over time with their strength that never dies. That is, until you, as the traveler, step in and solve the issue, seemingly for the foreseeable future and for good sealing the abyss away and granting you an audience with the spirits of the past. In conclusion, a lot is still unknown about Natlan's history and its beginning. The most interesting fact remains in the mention of the ruler of two worlds, perhaps Shbalanke, 
as the ruler of Nutlan and the Night Kingdom, who makes us aware that the Abyss is currently in a dormant state, waiting to land a grievous blow to the world. This was an early prediction for the Cataclysm to come much later, which is 500 years in the past for us, which was cut short, implying that this was only a small taste of the full destructive force of the Abyss. This ruler of two worlds was a being who witnessed the birth of civilizations, respected by dragons and perhaps sovereigns alike, as he knew about the future Hydro Sovereign being reborn as a human. This ruler was the first human to ascend, and eventually threw himself into the sacred flame, most likely aiming to be reborn into the future by extinguishing his own life prematurely. It is possible that Shbalanke is none other than the first human hybrid acknowledged by the dragons, mentioned in the roots of the spirit marrow, who resulted in a merge between their species and their bloodline, ascending to Celestia afterwards, who prophesies to him the rising of a ruler of two worlds. This is further implied by the rise of a new king, as bright as a newborn son, who united all tribes of Nathlan as Shbalanke did, considering that this figure appears far later into the story of the land, closer to the present times, giving us a full narrative from Shbalanke's birth and ascension, to his sacrifice to the sacred flame, and, finally, to his rebirth and return as a newborn king who united Natlan. Interestingly enough, another candidate for this position of ruler of two worlds is none other than the sage of the stolen flame himself as his existence also dates much further back, and his abilities being so… unique for this age. The people suspected him of being a dragon himself, like I've mentioned previously. With all that said, I believe most of the relevant topics have been covered for the current story, and more will be unveiled in time, adding new stories and completing currently existing ones. As the game progresses, I will be sure to cover them. If you enjoyed this video, I truly appreciate you giving a like and subscribe for future videos like this. Until then, I bid you a good now, and take care.